This Fleet Equipment unscripted interview is presented by Hendrickson, a leading manufacturer of heavy-duty suspension systems and components to the global commercial transportation industry. Visit hendrickson-intl.com to learn more. Hey everyone, Jason Morgan, Content Director for Fleet Equipment. Welcome to Fleet Equipment Unscripted. We're still here at the Kenworth headquarters in Kirkland, Washington. We're going to talk zero emissions. We're going to speak with Stefan Olson, General Sales Manager, zero emissions at Kenworth. We're going to talk about adoption, challenges, overcoming those, and really how the whole zero emissions landscape is shaking out, and how Kenworth is working with customers to educate them and, and talk with fleets about how they can move in this direction. So let's head inside and see what we can learn. Zero emissions emissions let's talk about it so battery dot right there's a lot going on here i feel like and it's a it's changing so rapidly um let's start with battery ev uh on where are we at with adoption has the has the first wave of adoption just kind of come and and they're adopted and gone is there is there more out there to be had what's your feeling for the market well the, the answer is yes to both um if you look at that classical adoption curve i think we've we've worked as an industry we've worked our way through the innovators, mm -hmm. the folks who want to be out in front, who want to try, experience, and hone their their operation of the zero emissions trucks. Mm -hmm. um, with Kenworth, we're now in our third year of building zero emissions trucks. Mm -hmm. And so we're at this point now where we're transitioning from those innovators into the early adopters. Right. And that's where we as an industry, not just Kenworth as an OEM, but everybody who engages in the, the zero emissions ecosystem is going to need to build scale mm -hmm. to deploy trucks to the early adopters as we hit that ramp of the adoption curve. So what we're experiencing here at Kenworth and through our dealer network is, is reaching those customers who have interest, who have a need for zero emissions, whether it's uh, from a business initiative or from a regulatory pressure standpoint, how do we one, get them the trucks to do the job that they need, but then how do we help them find the infrastructure to charge their trucks? All right. uh, and then of course, everything else that goes along with the service training the operator uh, experience to, to deploy those. So as we work into that transition point, it certainly opens up new opportunities for challenges to be solved uh, and to you know to continue to, to grow the population of zero emissions trucks out there. Right, right. I do want to touch on the infrastructure. I want to follow up on something you mentioned here about the dealers. How important is that dealer in this process? And it sounds like that's kind of the gateway to the wider uh, fleet customer world, where if the dealer has that relationship and they can explain it to them, then we get a greater adoption. You know, the, the importance of the dealer is no different than it is with a, a diesel truck sale. And, and what I mean by that is it's absolutely critical. The truck is a business tool. Uh, it's a complicated machine. There are many facets to how it interacts with the customer's operations. And a, a, a very significant tenant of that is the dealer relationship where they have the one, the sales experience to help consult the customer on what kind of a product they need, how to set up their charging infrastructure for the, the REITs, uh, the amount of freight that they need, the customer needs to haul. Uh, but then once the truck is is in the delivery process, there's that, that key handover, the handshake, and the introduction of the truck to the maintenance manager, to the drivers, to the technicians who might be in house of the fleet. All of them have, will have a new way of interacting with these trucks, and the dealer's role in helping get the customer up to speed is absolutely critical. And then finally, once the trucks are running, Trucks need service. I don't care what kind of a powertrain they have, and EVs are no different. Um, but you could add to that, there's this unique thing called the charger that we haven't had to deal with in the past. And that is a new piece of equipment that also requires service and upkeep and maintenance and troubleshooting. And our dealers play an important role in that aspect as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's dive into the charging side of that. Your infrastructure, clearly a big talking point. What are those those challenges that you see ahead right now for to develop this market? And what have been some of the wins you've worked through to make that happen? The, the challenge goes back to that, that as we hit the adoption curve and we start the hockey stick rise in truck adoption, Along with that comes the need for the, the infrastructure. And I'd say infrastructure is the biggest mm -hmm. uh, challenge that we've that we've run into uh, at Kenworth. I think it's probably true for just about anybody in the field. Yep. Um, interesting observation from our experience is when we when we went out, out over the past couple of years and worked with customers to evaluate 
locations where they plan to operate trucks. Right. We found that about 80% of those locations did not have adequate infrastructure to support the trucks the customers wanted to deploy. So with that said, um, we, we as Kenworth and Packcar, we take an active role in not only providing chargers, and we sell a line of Packcar mm-hmm. chargers to our customers, but through our uh, partner and tech solutions, uh, they can come on and help with the integration of of the charging infrastructure, doing the site planning, identify the hardware required, uh, being that connection with the utility to to plan the getting the cable in the ground and getting right. the, the cord uh, connecting to the truck. So it's um, in many cases a a long uh, deployment time frame. It can be as much as three years. I've heard from customers. Uh, who have gone to their local utility and laid out their aspiration. And uh, the utilities have said, well, your kind of demand is going to require a two to three year project uh, to, to make it happen. So those are all the challenges. What are we doing to to help work through those? Um, through our line of chargers, through our partner, we we can facilitate the, the planning mm-hmm. uh, and the development of the infrastructure mm-hmm. uh, development and, and integration. Um, but we can also help with the funding. That's a piece I haven't talked about yet is, of course, there's a lot of money that is required to make these things happen. And uh, we have a, a grant writer on my team mm-hmm. who not only can help uh, identify uh, and prepare grants to secure funding for the trucks, but the infrastructure as well. And that, that's a key piece in, in making this this machine work. Yeah, a lot of money available out there too. It's, comp- it's a complicated landscape though and, and you got to be able to uh, be able to navigate it your area mm-hmm. location comes into play there as well um, and you got to be at that point pretty serious that you want to get involved here and, and make a transition there to go down that line absolutely it's it's a commitment and a long-term play so in that case too let's say i'm a fleet and i'm like well this sounds hard i'll just wait for hydrogen right because hydrogen fuel cell will be the answer right <laughs> and again I think we're coming to terms that it's not necessarily a, a magic bullet scenario, but there's going to be these different levels of solutions, right? Hydrogen is growing in the conversation. I know that Kenworth has had a partnership with Toyota. Where is that? At? I, I know we've seen, I mean, you had that partnership well before a lot of the zero emission uh, vehicle uh, talk really ramped up. This has been a long time. I mean, where do you, where's the roadmap for hydrogen with Toyota? The, the roadmap is um, is moving forward. So you're right, the, the partnership uh, extends back several years uh, at the R&D level mm-hmm. uh, when Kenworth, um, I think, pioneered hydrogen fuel cell in, in Class 8 trucks. Mm-hmm. And it has matured into the um, agreement we have in the partnership to bring hydrogen fuel cell trucks to production. The program is moving along. Okay. We introduced the truck at ACT Expo uh, last year. Mm-hmm. And introduced our partnership and our plans to uh, to build customer trucks. Uh, we have uh, some development units uh, that we are that we have out in public uh, and using in trade shows and uh, demonstrating to customers. Uh, over the course of the next twelve to eighteen months, we'll be building a series of increasingly um, or, or trucks of increasing maturity as the development program moves along, and then our plan is to begin building customer units late in 2025 and uh and from there we'll like anything else we'll we'll scale uh as the demand continues to increase yeah that's amazing you know and uh, so as you're talking so look fleets are looking at that they're looking at that technology that's very interesting but i think we have the the infrastructure challenge on that side too battery electric we have a lot of answers to a lot of the questions that we had uh, gosh, like three or four years ago now, right? So uh, then there's other solutions. I mean, Kenworth's offering a bevy of solutions, the X15N on natural gas, even more efficient diesel, right? As you're talking with customers and fleets, are, is the decarbonization, is this, are, are they taking it seriously? Is it something they're looking at when they're thinking about their their truck equipment makeup here in the next two or three years? Or is it a, well, I'll wait and see how this all shakes out? Well, decarbonization can... And, uh, can happen in a variety of ways. It can happen with the zero emissions powertrain. It can happen with fuel economy, improving technologies. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you that 
any fleet that we do business with, any customer of ours is interested in improving their, their bottom line. Mm -hmm. And if you can reduce fuel consumption, uh, that typically can improve the, the uh, operating cost for, for a fleet. So I haven't met a, a customer who isn't interested in clean air or improving the efficiency of their fleet. Um, but at the same time, there are any businesses and they, they need their tools, their trucks to, to make a profit for them. So as we look at decarbonization, yes, there's battery electric, there's hydrogen fuel. So we've talked about a lot of the challenges uh, to, to deploying those trucks and scaling them. Uh, today, you know, I don't think anybody would tell you that you can uh, operate a truck like that at a profit without some assistance of, of grant funding. Uh, some are getting close in P&D applications and the like. But grant funding is a required lever. Um, so a as scale builds, that we expect that problem to be solved over time. But m my point here is that fleets are certainly interested in decarbonization tools like advanced aerodynamics, mm -hmm. low rolling resistance tires. Uh, as we look to you know further powertrain developments, we'll see hybridization of our uh, diesel powertrains, uh, electrification of accessories, all towards reducing that carbon footprint. And uh, of course, yeah, you mentioned natural gas that'll that'll play a significant role as well, right? Well, to your point, I mean, we have you you have a lot of answers. You've done a lot of work putting these, like even in the EVs, I'm putting EVs in the applications, getting them in the customer hands, figuring out how number one they can handle the application where the charging infrastructure is available and conducive to their duty cycles. You have that, and even to the point here where you point out, well, hey, to do this in a in a way that kind of meets some parity that you're looking for in, in some regard to the vehicles you're operating now, right? That grant funding is a portion of that and how you can think about the equation, right? I think it's, it's even interesting to hear about the answers and solutions we do have on what works instead of, well, you know, this is how we think it's going to work. There's been a lot of lessons learned over the past couple of years. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you were to, to to kind of put a bow on that is that almost everything is unique about launching ZEVs and operating ZEVs, whether it's in the planning. We talked about all the complexity of planning to deploy the trucks, the, the servicing, the operation, uh, just the route planning, how you run the trucks or where you send them, um, how you charge them, how you plan the timing of the charging. All of these come into play in optimizing and getting the most out of that business tool. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an example. We, we were working with a customer uh, recently about extending the, the range of their truck mm. to get more out of it on the daily routes. And conventional wisdom would tell you that if you're running a diesel truck, the most efficient way to do that would be to get it up on the highway, run it at steady state speeds mm -hmm. uh, where the diesel's operating most efficiently. And sometimes that would mean running a longer distance, mm -hmm. a more efficient operating mode versus two lanes where you've got stop and go. Okay. Oh, sure. With a battery electric truck, that may not be the case, where if you're running stop and go at lower speeds, you can take advantage of regenerative braking, put energy back in the batteries, and get the truck to run further. So it's just a, an interesting and practical example of how we really need to rethink almost every facet of how we operate and work with these trucks as we as we bring them to market. Well, I know, so you're, but you're actually seeing a substantial or at least worthwhile range I would say impact, right? In doing that, like even like that far down to the routing of stopping the overs on a highway, that is worthwhile in, in uh, absolutely. If you just have to think in simple terms, if you're running a, a vehicle at 60, 65 miles an hour, the aerodynamic drag becomes a very significant contributor to the, to the range and the efficiency of, of the vehicle. And if you're running an EV and, and stop and go every time you come to a stop, you're putting energy back into the into the truck. So mm. while it might not be the most efficient from a time standpoint, it can be the most efficient in terms of adding range to the truck to to get more to get more deliveries, more loops mm. in, in a given day or a given shift. Yeah, that is really I mean, even in like a regional hall type application too, where you do have some substantial weight in a trailer, uh, in, in that case too. But you have the torque to kind of get that load moving uh, right off the line on the stop and go, and then that weight bringing down the or just the, the braking power needed to bring the weight to a, to a stop there going back into the batteries. It's yeah. super interesting. One, one of the advantages of the EV powertrain is that instantaneous torque and, and lots of it. One of the things that our, the drivers tell us they really appreciate. 
Yeah. Uh, and real quick on that too. I, I know I keep peppering you with with, uh, with new stuff, but the driver. What have you heard from drivers? Do they see it? I mean, you know, I think they unfairly get painted as as technology uh, adverse a little bit. But have there has there been any good driver feedback? Uh, the biggest thing is what they can't hear: the lack of noise. They they really appreciate the reduced MBH. Uh, and if you've spent any time in a diesel truck, I mean, you, you that that persistent rumble of a diesel is there. Um, and it's not there in an EV. So the over the course of a 10-hour shift, um, the lack of that noise, just in terms of reducing fatigue on the, on the body, is significant, something drivers note. Um, at the instantaneous torque, mm-hmm. uh, just the ability to get through intersections or you know, across railroad tracks timely and, and predictably, right. that's something that drivers really, really appreciate. All right. Very good. Well, hey, I learned a bunch. I appreciate you taking time. It's been a wonderful time. Likewise. Thank you.